All right, new section. Section 3.8 in our book, we talk about implicit differentiation, which is a pretty fun little topic. What's cool about it is we don't really do anything new, I guess. We just kind of have a different perspective on things that we've already been doing. What do I mean by that? Well, let me kind of start with an example. What a typical problem has looked like in our class is, maybe I ask you to take the derivative of, let's say, x plus 3 times x minus 3. And maybe what you do is look at this and you're like, mm, I don't really want to use the product rule. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to algebraically rewrite what I have inside the derivative symbols. And since x plus 3 times x minus 3 is just x squared minus 9, I can say that the derivative of this original expression is the same as the derivative of x squared minus 9. And the nice thing about this form is it's a derivative that I can take, right? It's 2x minus 0. In other words, just 2x. The point is a typical problem in this class might be written sort of this way. I kind of think about this as like a linear fashion. Like we have one line and then a line below that it's equal to and a line below that it's equal to and so on. Contrast that with solving equations. So I don't know, for example, if I gave you the equation x squared minus nine equals zero. I mean, there's a few different ways you can do this, but one way you could solve this equation is by adding nine to both sides of the equation, which produces x squared equals nine. And then at this point, you can take the square root of both sides of the equation and you get x equals plus or minus the square root of nine. In other words, three is your solutions. Down here, we're kind of progressing in this like linear fashion where in each step, we write a line below the line that's equal to the line above it. Over here, what we're doing is kind of similar in that in each step below the line, we're writing another line that's equivalent to the line above it. But really the way we're moving from one line to the next here is by doing things to both sides of the equation. Right from here to here, I added nine to both sides of the equation. From here to here, I took the square root of both sides of the equation. I'm not doing things to both sides of the equation down here with derivatives, but it turns out you can. It turns out it's perfectly legitimate to take the derivative of both sides of the equation. And if that's ever useful to you, you can do it. The fact that x squared minus nine equals x plus three times x minus three means that the derivative of x squared minus nine equals the derivative of x plus three times x minus three. I mean, you could argue that the fact that we're allowed to take the derivative of both sides of an equation is kind of coming into play as we rewrite these different lines, but we're not explicitly taking the derivative of both sides like we did up here, but you can. Maybe a better illustration of that is I could give you f of x some function equals x squared minus nine. And then if you took the derivative of both sides of the equation, you'd be saying f prime of x, the derivative of f of x, is the derivative of x squared minus nine. Maybe up until today, you thought about this as sort of the question and this is more of the answer. But another way that you could think about this is I have an equation here and to produce the line down below, I'm taking the derivative of both sides of the equation. I don't know if this is helping anybody. The point that I'm trying to make is it's perfectly legitimate mathematically to take the derivative of both sides of an equation. And that hasn't really been helpful. I mean, maybe it gives a slightly different perspective on the things that we've done so far, but it's definitely not anything we've had to worry about, which is why we've never really worried about it. But it turns out there's a very practical use case for taking the derivative of both sides of the equation. And it happens when your equation is solved implicitly as opposed to explicitly, which is where this name implicit differentiation comes from. What I'm saying is typically when you have an equation in two variables with X's and Y's, you see Y equals something in terms of X y is solved explicitly in terms of x but sometimes that's not the case the standard form of the equation of a circle for example is a good example here's an equation it involves both x's and y's but i don't have y equals something in terms of x in fact i can't even solve this equation for y without introducing a plus or minus symbol because y is not a function of x in this case. But it's a relationship between x and y that defines a circle, specifically the circle that's centered at 2, negative 3 with a radius of 4. And since we can picture what such a circle would look like, we could talk about the slope of the circle, or more specifically, the slope of the tangent line to the circle, if we could figure out derivatives. And it turns out you can figure out derivatives even when your equation is defined implicitly as opposed to explicitly. How do you do it? Well, the trick, I mean, the summary of the entire section is you have to treat the y's different than you treat the x's. X's, we're going to do the same thing we've always done. X is just a variable, so its derivative is just equal to 1. But the y is not a variable. We're going to think about the y as a function. So when we take the derivative, we can't just say that its derivative is equal to 1. So what is the derivative of a y if it's not equal to 1? Well, we're going to use the symbol y prime as its derivative. The only thing you do differently in this section with implicit differentiation is you're going to have equations that are going to have x's and y's, and you treat the x's and the y's differently. X's, treat them just like you've been treating them. Y's, just remember, they're not variables, they're functions. So when you take their derivatives, 
The answer is not just equal to one. How would that work? Let me show you. Let's try to determine y prime, which by the way, it's sometimes denoted dy divided by dx to tell the reader that we're treating the y's and the x's differently. The y's we're gonna treat them as a function, the x we're gonna treat them as a variable. For this equation, x minus two squared plus y plus three squared equals 16. What do we do? Well, we're gonna take the derivative of both sides of the equation. I got the derivative of x minus two squared plus y plus three squared. And I'm gonna say that's equal to the derivative of 16. When y is defined implicitly as opposed to explicitly, the things we're gonna be taking derivatives of are gonna be equations as opposed to expressions. So we're gonna treat things slightly differently. We're gonna be taking the derivative of both sides of that equation that gets us here. We kind of have two different problems, right? On the right side of the equation, we have to figure out the derivative of 16. Good news, that's the same as it's always been. 16 is a constant. The derivative of 16 is still just equal to zero. What about the left-hand side of the equation though? That looks quite a bit more complicated. Well, it is, but don't forget the things that you already know, right? I'm taking the derivative of something plus something. So I can think about that as the derivative of the first thing, x minus two squared, plus the derivative of the second thing, y plus three squared. I have two d over dx symbols on this line, so kind of two problems left to solve. What's the derivative of x minus two squared? Well, maybe you'd recognize a chain rule in here. The outer function is the stuff being squared, the inner function is the x minus two. So to take the derivative of x minus two squared, I'm gonna first use the power rule. So I bring that exponent of two down in front, my new exponent is just a one, leaving the inside function completely alone. And then I'm gonna multiply that by the derivative of my inside function. The derivative of x minus two squared is two times x minus two to the first power times the derivative of x minus two. But what about all this stuff over here? Well, I can kind of do the same thing. I got a chain rule going on here. The outer function is the stuff being squared. The inner function is the y plus three. I know it's a little bit weird to see this y plus three instead of x plus three, but it doesn't even come into play in this line because in this line, we're using the chain rule and we only focus on the outer function. So we're using this power rule. We don't take the derivative of the y plus three part until the next step. So while things might look a little bit different than what we've done, I'd argue that we really haven't done anything new up to this step. I can clean up this side a little bit when I'm raising something to the first power. I don't even need to write that. So I have two times x minus two, and then I'll figure out the derivative of x minus two, which is the derivative of x plus the derivative of negative two. The derivative of x is just equal to one. The derivative of negative two is zero. So the derivative of x minus two is one plus zero, in other words, one, which really I didn't even need to write down here. What about over here? Well, I got two times y plus three to the first power. Again, I don't have to write that exponent of one. Then I have to multiply that by the derivative of y plus three. And here's where you have to be a little bit careful. The derivative of y is not equal to one. Y is a function, its derivative is y prime. The derivative of three is still equal to zero. It's only the y that we treat differently than the x that we had over here. I think I mentioned before that sometimes instead of writing y prime, we write dy divided by dx. Maybe you can kind of see why you would do that here. I'm taking the derivative of y. I just call that y prime because I like that notation. But if you thought about this as a fraction, y divided by one, and if you thought about this as multiplication, it's not multiplication, but if you thought about it as multiplication, d divided by dx times y divided by one, I guess would be equal to dy divided by dx. We're not multiplying these things together at all here, but the reason this notation is chosen for the derivative of y is because if you kind of think about it as multiplication, then things sort of work out. I don't want you thinking this is multiplication here, so I'm not gonna write things as dy over dx. I'm gonna use y prime as the derivative of y, but just in case you have a teacher in the future that writes things a little bit differently, that might be y. Let's clean things up a little bit here. I got two times x minus two times one, which I don't even have to write, plus two times y plus three times y prime plus zero, in other words, y prime, that's equal to zero. I don't have any more d over dx symbols, so you might think we're done, but we're actually not done at this stage because remember what we're trying to figure out is y prime. Because y was given implicitly, y prime shows up implicitly as part of this equation that we get when we take the derivative of both sides. So to finish this problem, what I have to do is solve this equation for y prime. A little low on room, maybe I can kind of come over here. If I were trying to get this y prime all by itself, maybe first I'd subtract this term to the other side. So I'd get two times 
y plus 3 times y prime equals negative 2 times x minus 2. And then maybe I divide both sides by 2 times y plus 3. And I get y prime equals negative 2 over x minus 2 divided by 2 times y plus 3. At this stage, I've solved for y prime, so you could argue that I'm done, but I'm gonna take it a step further and cancel out these twos to make my final answer the negative of x minus two divided by y plus three. What is this telling you? It's telling you that the slope of the tangent line to this curve is given by this expression right here. To figure out the slope of the tangent line to this curve, I need to know both the x coordinate and the y coordinate. So for example, if somebody asked me to find the slope of the tangent line to this curve at the point 2, 1, I could figure that out. I'd say I have this equation which tells me the slope of the tangent line to the curve at any point. So if x equals 2 and y equals 1, then y prime would be equal to the negative of 2 minus 2 divided by 1 plus 3. In other words, the negative of 0 divided by 4. In other words, negative 0. In other words, 0. What I'm saying is the slope of the tangent line to this curve at this point is equal to zero. Wait, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. Remember, this is the standard form of a circle who's centered at two, negative three. So there's the center of my circle right there with a radius of four. So if I go up four units, it's this point. If I go to the right four units, it's this point. Down four units, it's this point. Left four units, it's this point. I can use these points to sketch something that more or less has the shape that I'm looking for of a circle. Not the prettiest circle, but close enough. What we're trying to figure out is the slope of the tangent line to this circle at the point 2, 1. Let's see, the point 2, 1 is right here. If you had to draw the tangent line to this circle at this point, it would look like this. It would be a horizontal line. What's the slope of a horizontal line? Well, it's zero. The whole point is we can extrapolate this idea of a derivative because the derivative just tells us the slope of the tangent line to a curve to equations that aren't defined explicitly. In other words, equations where the y is defined implicitly. Sometimes the reason the y is defined implicitly is because your equation is not a function. Think vertical line test. This green graph would not pass the vertical line test, therefore this green graph does not represent a function. But just because it's not a function doesn't mean we can't talk about the slope of the tangent line to a curve. All we have to do is come up with the equation of that curve and then take the derivative of both sides using this new process called implicit differentiation. Note that in this problem, we had to find the slope of the tangent line to this curve at the point 2, 1. We're given both the x and the y coordinates. That's important because if you look at your derivative over here, the derivative is a function of both x and y, meaning you need to know what x is and what y is if you want to figure out y prime. And that makes sense. Look at this example down here. We have the exact same circle centered at two, negative three with the radius of four. So it's what's pictured up here in green. Suppose we're asked to find the slope of the tangent line to this circle at x equals four. Well, that's kind of an unfair question, right? Because x equals four right here corresponds with two different points on this curve. Why does it correspond with two different points on this curve? Because this curve is not a function. If this curve is a function, then it passes the vertical line test. So a given x coordinate can only have one y coordinate that it corresponds with. So we never run into this problem if we have a function. But as I mentioned, implicit differentiation allows us to talk about this idea of derivatives even when the curve doesn't represent a function. And that's what's going on here. So what's going on in this question? We want to find the slope of the tangent line, but you're like, right, is it the slope of this tangent line right here? Or is it the slope of this tangent line down here? Well, they tell us that the y coordinate is greater than negative three. So specified in this problem is that we're talking about this point and not this point down here, but that has to be specified. It's no longer enough to just be told the x coordinate. You need to either explicitly be told the y coordinate like we were up here or be given enough information that, that you can figure out what the y coordinate is. What is the y coordinate right here? Well, I know the x coordinate and I know the equation of the circle. So all I got to do is plug into this equation four everywhere I see an x. Four minus two squared plus y plus three squared has to be equal to 16. Note, I'm not plugging into the derivative, I'm plugging into the equation itself because I wanna know the y coordinate of this point right here. On the left, I got two squared plus y plus three squared equals 16. Two squared is just four. So if I subtract four from both sides, I get y plus three squared equals 12. My goal is to get this y all by itself, so I'm gonna take the square root of both sides of the equation. I got y plus three equals plus or minus the square root of 12. So when I subtract three from both sides, I get y equals negative three plus or minus the square root of 12. 
wait a minute, plus or minus, doesn't that give you two different values of y? Yeah, absolutely it does, right? This equation does not know that y has to be greater than negative three. This equation is telling me when x equals four, y could be this value or it could be this value. This value is negative three plus the square root of 12. This value is negative three minus the square root of 12. How do I know that? Because negative three is right here. And the square root of 12 is a positive number. So if I add to negative three, it brings me up to this value. And if I subtract from negative three, it brings me down to this value. What I'm saying is because y is greater than negative three, that tells us our y coordinate is negative three plus the square root of 12. So what's the slope of the tangent line to this curve if x equals four and y equals negative three plus the square root of 12? Well, we do the same analysis we did before. This equation right here gives us the slope of the tangent line at any point x comma y. So I just copy exactly what I see up here, changing all of the x's into fours and changing all of the y's into negative three plus the square root of 12. This expression tells me the slope of the tangent line pictured in pink up here. I can simplify it a little bit. Four minus two is equal to two and negative three plus three cancels out. So I get the negative of two divided by the square root of 12. It's tempting to leave your answer like this, but maybe you learned how to reduce radicals. One thing you might recognize is the square root of 12 is the same as the square root of four times the square root of three. And the reason it's beneficial to write it that way is the square root of four is just equal to two because four is a perfect square. So I get the negative of two divided by two times the square root of three, which simplifies to just negative one divided by the square root of three. We've simplified this fraction, but we can actually go a step further by rationalizing. If you multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of three, you get negative square root of three divided by three. This is the answer to the question and you don't have to go any further. However, if you recognize that value, negative square root of three divided by three, it comes from the fact that the point that I chose up here corresponds with an angle of pi over three measured in the standard position. So thinking back to your trig class, you might remember that the slope of this line in green right here is given by the tangent of pi over three and the tangent of pi over three is equal to the square root of three. Maybe at some point you learn that the slopes of perpendicular lines are negative reciprocals of each other. In other words, you have to change the sign and flip the fraction upside down. If you change the sign on tangent of pi over three to negative and flip the fraction upside down, you get this negative one divided by the square root of three, which is equal to our answer down here. You weren't supposed to see that. You don't have to do anything with that. I just think it's kind of interesting that we can tie this together with some ideas that we learned back in a trig class. What you need to know from calculus is with implicit differentiation, it's useful to take the derivative of both sides of the equation. And the nice thing about doing so is all the rules that you've learned before still apply. The only difference is you have to treat the letter Y a little bit differently than you treat the letter X. But what you do differently is very minor. Just remember that its derivative is no longer just one, it's Y prime. That's it. Take the derivative of both sides, that gives you an equation that has a Y prime in it. You solve for that Y prime and that's your derivative. Often problems don't end there, although sometimes they do. Often you want to evaluate that derivative at a given point. Just know with implicit differentiation, you typically need to know both the X and Y coordinates of that point, which sometimes are given to you, and sometimes you need to figure out by using the original equation. That's the idea of implicit differentiation. To make sure this makes sense, I'll do a bunch of examples in the next video.